You know, sometimes the medical professionals show up and they seem to be under the weather uh, themselves, but it is a common occurrence. I, uh, we've had a, an upper respiratory virus that has been making its rounds throughout the area over the last few weeks. Russell Singleton is joining us in studio, physician assistant from Trip Family Medicine here in Twin Falls. Uh, first of all, welcome back to the show. Thanks. Good to be here. Uh, you do sound a little congested. Yeah, it's just one of those little bugs that go around. It's hard to be surrounded with that all day and not eventually uh, be considered collateral damage. We do have to remember that medical professionals are working with people who have. That's the reason they're in your office. So many times they come in if they've got colds or they've got the uh, they've got influenza. We had our first influenza death in the state this week, in fact. Uh, yeah. So, but you people are exposed to it twenty well, not twenty four seven, but. 10, 12 hours a day many times. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to think that after a while, our immune systems become maybe a little bit better because of that frequent exposure. But the thing that works best for us to prevent is the thing that works best for everyone else, and that's washing hands and uh, trying not to share the same air for longer than you have to. Back here somewhere on my counter is one of those hand sanitizers, which I notice people are using at church now before they do the greeting and shake hands. I don't know that it works, but it seems to be fairly common. You know, I think it does, actually, and, and I'd be a proponent of that. But as long as it doesn't replace washing hands, I think there's there's something that's so much more effective about using soap and water. And it doesn't even have to be antibacterial soap. In fact, we're moving away from the use of antibacterial soap. It's just uh, picking up those germs in the, in the suds and rinsing them off the hand, I think, is much more effective. But in a pinch... I think some alcohol hand sanitizer is great. I'm getting you way off the beaten path today. That's okay. <laughs> We're here to talk about all things health. You have some other items, though, you wanted to mention. Yeah, in fact, I, I was prepared a, a week or two ago, but I didn't make it. And I wanted to talk a little bit about diabetes because as I was thinking back on all the things I had talked about, I, I couldn't remember talking about diabetes, or at least not in a while, as I think we've probably been doing this show close to two two years. Two years, maybe. Yeah. So it's something I deal with every day uh, and multiple times a day. It's something that about 30 million Americans deal with every day. And the scary thing about that statistic is that about a third of them have no idea that they even have diabetes. They're, they're just walking around, uh, living their lives, maybe, maybe wondering why, why they feel kind of tired or kind of fatigued or, or why they are thirsty all the time or why they have to urinate um, more often than, than, than not. But of those um, probably 10 million people that don't know they have diabetes, a lot of them don't have any symptoms at all. And that's why it's important to get in and have your yearly checkup at the least. I was visiting with an uncle a couple of weekends ago. He's in his 80s. Uh, they did not know that he had diabetes until a couple of years ago when he, he had a chest x-ray at his doctor's left. And he got up to the light that he normally goes to to turn for home. He turned the wrong direction, drove through a city with no recollection of it, and then came to a rolling stop against a, 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 a rock wall after he jumped a curb on the other end of town. And then they said he had gone into a sugar shock. But that was the first indication they had when he was around 80 years old that he actually was diabetic. You know, we are at Trip Family Medicine, all, all three of our, our providers are certified medical examiners for the Department of Transportation. So we deal with commercial drivers, and many of them have diabetes, and the, there's very strict rules for what they can and can't be doing, um, what their labs can or can't be in order to drive a commercial vehicle. And interestingly enough, that, that they allow blood sugars to, to average quite quite high, an A1C of 10, and we'll talk about that a little bit later what that means, but what I know is is a risk uh, in my practice, probably more so than those blood sugar levels getting high, which absolutely is a problem. It can cause uh, a coma-like state, is when someone is on insulin and they either don't measure correctly or they don't eat and their blood sugar drops. That's That's typically one of our more common worries is when blood sugar goes too low. We've got about a minute left. I think we may have a, a caller with us, and we'll see if the caller has a question or comment. What we can do is get that on the air, and then maybe after the break, get back to it. Uh, we have, of course, uh, from Trip Family Medicine, Russell Singleton in studio with us. And caller, what's your question or comment for Russell? We just wanted to call and wish Russell a happy birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. 
thing is, I have no idea who those people are. You have no idea. No, yeah. that's that. That's our office. Thank you, guys. You're wonderful. <laughs> um, you know, can we point out the fact that you're still relatively young? Uh, the birthdays aren't really getting to that point where you worry about them yet. Well, it it. I, I'm definitely feeling the extra rotation around the sun. I have one coming up next week, and I'll tell you something. You get to a certain age, and you realize there's no real significant numbers left anymore. <laughs> um, 18 means, you know, 17, 18, you can drive. Yeah, or uh, boat, or yeah. 30 is always a big marker, but 50, I guess, too. But once you're beyond that, uh, there are none that you consider remarkable any longer. I think I'm able to actually rent a car. <laughs> we got more coming up. And I did that for the first time in my life about 10 days ago. Yeah, it took that long. We've got more with Russell Singleton, physician assistant from Trip Family Medicine, on the way in a couple of minutes. 20 minutes now from 9 o'clock. It's 41. Uh, yes, just a reminder, it, uh, it is our guest's uh, birthday. Um, he, he's not going to talk about his age, though. Uh, well, I'm going to guess. Russell, you're probably early 30s. Uh, that's pretty close, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll go with that. 842. Bill Colley with you as well, handling the telephones today on Better Health with Trip Family Medicine. We're at 40, and uh, for people who'd like to get in touch with you at the office, first of all, there's a number of ways to do that. They can call later on if they want to wish you a happy birthday, but just keep in mind, <laughs> you don't want to tie up the phones at the doctor's office. That's, that's right. Uh, give us a call, 208-933-4400, and we're, we're pretty good about fitting people in same day or next day, depending on what's going on, and we try and give that preference to our existing patients. But uh, with Jeremy and I holding down the fort today, I think as busy as we are, we can still tr make a little bit of room. And again, people can also check you out on the web. I mean, there's a plenty of opportunities. They could even see some of the, uh, the videos of the show. Yeah, we've got a lot going on on our Facebook page, actually. And if you just look for Trip Family Medicine on Facebook, you'll find some information about our upcoming Peel parties. It, it'll be our second Peel party that we, that we have done. So if, if you're interested or you're curious about what that even means, log on and take a look. Wanted to point out we're talking about diabetes this morning, and if you've got a question or comment too as well, uh, feel free to join us, and uh, Russell can uh, walk you in the right direction, give you an answer potentially. Uh, you were talking about doing the testing earlier with, with drivers, and because uh, we were much, over the years, we've become a lot m m tougher on commercial drivers, uh, for instance, you know, with drug use and alcohol mm -hmm. use, but even something like uh, diabetes, because you can't be behind the wheel and passing out with a big rig. I mean, I saw a guy pulling three trailers through town the other day. Uh, that's a, that would be a recipe for disaster. But you were pointing out that the limit, though, is still, um, you know, that, that we're not necessarily barring people from doing this because of that ailment. I, I think that that could be answered at, uh, in, in a couple of ways. Again, the, the risk is not so much hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugar, even though that can cause complications, it can cause loss of, of consciousness, especially in someone who is actually a type 1 diabetic. Uh, these folks are usually diagnosed in childhood or, or in their early teens. There's something called ke uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, which is a, a very dangerous state. But for most diabetics uh, who have type 2 diabetes, and I think we'll get a chance to talk about that and how it differs in just a minute, the risk is low blood sugar, what we call hypoglycemia. And, and that can happen a lot of different ways. It can happen if you're not eating regularly. It can happen if your medications are, are prone to causing hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. But in the case of a commercial driver, the, the concern is insulin. And I, I think there are... They're, they're a little bit unfair to those drivers who use a, a basal insulin or long-acting insulin. So if, if our listeners have heard of Lantus or Levomir, uh, those are some of the older ones. I think the risk for hypoglycemia is pretty low because that insulin is, is, it, uh, is very steady. It doesn't, doesn't peak per se. It has a very flat curve. But still, the risk of having a blood sugar go low and losing control of a commercial vehicle is why it is getting harder for commercial drivers. We, I, I've unfortunately had to fill a lot of them uh, since the regulations changed two or three years ago, but oftentimes too it's high blood pressure or it's sleep apnea. So if you're a commercial driver or if you're thinking about being one, get in and get checked because it, it's getting tougher and tougher to get past, let alone get a two-year clearance. You know, you referenced at the beginning of the program a lot of people don't know 
they're walking around. They don't know that they have diabetes. But would there be certain symptoms that would be a giveaway and tell them, you know, you should really get this checked? Yeah, absolutely. So the the three we talk most about in, in school are, and to use the medical term, polyuria, uh, polydipsia, and essentially those two at least refer to the increased thirst and then increased water consumption and increased urination, uh, rounding out the three. So a, a person might not really notice much except for that they're maybe going to the bathroom a little bit more. And, and, that, and they might write that off as, well, I'm just drinking too much water. And in a, and in a case, that, that could be true. Or they're drinking too much caffeine or they're just feeling dehydrated or whatever. It's really easy to write off. But some people will also feel just that they're kind of fogged. They're, 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 they have trouble concentrating. They have headaches. They just uh, poor energy. They're, they're really quite vague. We have a caller with us, and it's uh, coming up on 847, Better Health with Trip Family Medicine on KLIX. And uh, we're at 40. Caller, you're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, good morning. Um, I am in the trucking business. I call in the show on occasion, and you're right about that. I've done it over 40 years. What happens to the guys is it's almost all diet. And they sit there and gain a ton of weight, and, and it's, it's not getting around enough. And I've had guys with trouble before, diabetic, and it's hell anymore. They will... Uh, negate your CDL and you're out of business or you're out of a job if you don't have your own equipment. But either way, is it's diet. I'm almost positive most of it's diet, and uh, I'm sure you guys deal with that. I had a grandfather who was diabetic, and uh, he took insulin, and he was always athletic and bowling and the vice president of a bank, very successful man, but always in good health as far as that. But when he was older, he had terrible diabetes. You know, on that point, he brings up something when his grandfather uh, had this. There's two types. His grandfather sounds like he was he had the type that a lot of people are born with versus uh, somebody who's, who's being inactive and eating the wrong foods develops. Yeah, and, and essentially the difference is, and, and this is a little bit simplified, but, but to help folks understand, the, the difference is insulin production. A type 1 patient will have no insulin production because their pancreas has basically given up the ghost. Now, in someone with type 2, they go through years of insulin overproduction uh, because the body's resistant. And diet does have a huge, huge role in that, especially as diet causes someone to gain weight. That causes resistance to insulin. So the pancreas responds by trying to produce more and more and more and overcome that resistance. However, eventually it gives up. And a type 2 can essentially convert into a type 1 and be insulin dependent. Now, I had an uncle who got taken off. He was a long-haul truck driver. Uh, he blew out a knee, and he couldn't climb in and out of the truck very easily anymore, so they moved him to dispatch. But not everybody can move to dispatch and get a job there. I mean, there is only a limited number. So for a lot of these people who are actually not passing this test when it comes to diabetes, uh, is there a way? I know that the job, you can't really exercise behind the wheel, but is there a way they can improve things? I, I, saying you've got off time as a truck driver too, you know, I don't know. I mean, some of these guys are really busy, but can't, are there things they can do to try to, because I know that the, the other type you mentioned, you can actually reduce that, right? Well, I, I think to the caller's point, diet does have a huge, a huge role, at least in type two diabetes. And, and he's right. The life of a trucker is difficult. You're, you're behind the wheel for probably 12 plus hours a day. I'm sure a lot of them drive 16 or 18 hours a day and your food they choices don't tell people they're doing that but they do right right right, right. <laughs> um their their food choices are limited and their ability to get fresh food you know home homemade or home cooked meals is is limited and i know if i was stuck in one place looking at at the road i'm i'm, I'm probably going to overeat i'm going to i'm going to eat things that not only aren't healthy but because i have nowhere else to go and nothing else to do i'm going to eat too much so it's an issue of food quality just as much as it is food quantity. So one of the first things they need to start doing is planning, planning for meals. And, and I know it's hard, but it can be done. Bring a lot of your meals with you. Make sure you've got healthy snacks. And then try and exercise whenever you can, even if it just means walking around the truck, doing some sit-ups, doing some jumping jacks. If, if you were able to reduce your weight by only 10%, we're talking maybe 20 pounds for the average person, you could drastically reduce your risk for type 2 diabetes. If you were to exercise 
30 minutes a day, and we're talking moderate exercise, like your, your, your heart rate needs to be elevated, you could drastically reduce your risk for diabetes. I had a, a friend, well, an acquaintance that I knew many, many years ago, uh, and uh, he did not know that he was diabetic for many, many years. And by the time he was about 60, he discovered he could not walk well anymore. And then they discovered, is it called necrosis? Uh, Neuropathy is probably what. Well, he, he had a difficulty in a foot, right. And, and, and so eventually ended up in a wheelchair. He, he had owned a, a tavern. And he even admitted to me, he said he would sit there and drink with his customers, he said, every night for 40 years, which probably didn't help his situation. And so he, by the time he was in his early 60s, could no longer walk. And then the next time I visited him, a couple of years after he learned about this, he was reading uh, books through a large screen because his vision was fading, and then eventually he had to go to books on tape, and he's 77 years old now and completely blind, um, still functioning and in, in, you know, in, has his mind and his intelligence, but he can't walk and he can't see. And these are the things that these people are going to deal with unless there's a, an intervention at some point. Yeah, sustained high levels of blood sugar will start to destroy the delicate nerves and vessels in the body. Those delicate nerves seem to, to, to fail first in the extremities, and that's what we call neuropathy, diabetic neuropathy or peripheral neuropathy. They fail in the kidneys and they fail in the eyes. Would you believe that diabetes is the leading cause of blindness in working adults? So much so that when a person is diagnosed type one, remember we're usually talking youth here, we have them get an eye exam within about a year to two years. When an adult is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, they need an eye exam immediately because we don't know how long they've been diabetic. We don't know how long they've had these elevated blood sugars. We don't know what damage has already been done. Uh, that's called diabetic retinopathy, and it, it can be absolutely devastating, and it's irreversible. Uh, and that's the the one thing is that we're seeing, I think, with these older folks who have developed this and been unaware of it is probably uh, the disability costs will skyrocket with this generation because of it, right? The cost to, to care for diabetes in this country tops about $250 billion, $70 billion in lost productivity. So if we're talking about ways to reduce healthcare spending in our country and reduce the, the, the burden of, of healthcare costs, if we just targeted diabetes with exercise and better diet choices, we're talking a savings of $250 billion. And, and actually, on, on that note, on the exercise note, I want to add um, a, a little something that I've been thinking about. With the, the release of the Apple Watch, there's this renewed focus on exercise trackers. Uh, Fitbits are popular. And there's an emphasis on getting 10,000 steps. And, and I, I think it's great that people who may not have been active are trying to get active now. However, I, I, I want to, to, to let folks know that 10,000 steps a day will not cut it. 20,000 steps a day will not cut it. it. It's not about how often or how much your feet move. It's about intensity. It's about heart rate. So if you're using your, your uh, exercise tracker to, to watch your heart rate and to make sure that you're exercising for 30 minutes a day at an elevated heart rate, you're good. But, but if you're thinking walking 10,000 steps or, or 15,000 steps is going to cause significant weight loss and significant improvements in your health, I, I think you're, 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 you're probably missing the mark a bit. I have a friend who's in uh, nursing in uh, the Sarasota area in Florida. And she got the Fitbit and started walking after work every day. And she did lose some weight. But her she had a birthday this week, too. Uh, but she, when you see her Facebook posts, you know, she likes to make a lot of puddings and pies and cakes and the like, which is probably counteracting all of the Fitbit walking that she's doing. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that is a bad habit that we as human beings have, that when we exercise, we tend to consume more afterward, whether it's because we're hungry or because we feel like we deserve it or we burned off those calories and now everything's going to even out. So one has to be very, very careful of that. But the interesting thing is a diabetic diet is really not much different than the type of diet we should all be eating. So if you're thinking, well, shoot, I have diabetes, but I also have kids or I have a spouse, they, you know, they don't, and we just can't afford to make two meals. Again, I think there's probably some 
uh, some misunderstanding. We should all be eating a pretty low carb diet, or at least a carb controlled diet. I think whole grain carbs are great, and they should still take up or, or compose maybe forty to fifty percent of our daily calories. But but most of us eat more carbs than that, and we eat bad carbs. We eat a lot of sugar. We eat a lot of processed, refined carbs, and a healthy diet for anyone will will, will scale that back. You know, and that's uh, something we've got about a minute left, uh, Russell. But uh, when I when I hear about people talking about what they're eating and, and how they're going about this, um, there, there's also the, the the volume because if you go out and eat a lot, people have noticed over the last twenty years the plate's gotten about twice as big around. Absolutely, I've got a little slideshow actually that I might bring one one time just to show you, but it it speaks to exactly that point. There is a picture of, uh, of serving sizes 20, 30 years ago in all sorts of different things, a sandwich, an ice cream cone, a, a thing of fries, whatever, and then compared it to an average serving size today, and it is incredible. It, it's almost doubled. And we're talking about the average single serving size for almost anything. And it's gradual, so people really haven't maybe even noticed that that's happened. Yeah, e learning to eat until you are satisfied versus full could be an invaluable skill all of itself. Learning to push back the plate and say, there's still food there, I'm not hungry anymore, I may not be stuffed full, but I'm satisfied. That's when you need to, to, to stop. And again, for people, we've got to wrap up, but for people who'd like to get in touch uh, with the office, Maybe they're looking for a doctor. Uh, maybe they're looking uh, just to get a question or two answered. What would you tell them to do? Give us a call at 933-4400. Look us up on Facebook. Visit us on the web, tripfamilymedicine.com. We're, we're growing still. We're accepting new patients and still able to fit in a lot of same or next day. We'll talk to you again somewhere in the rotation, at least in the next month. I, I will plan on it. I want to thank Russell Singleton, physician assistant from Trip Family Medicine. For joining us in studio this morning on Top Story in Better Health with Trip Family Medicine, we've got news at 9 o'clock. And then in the following hour, we're going to spend a few minutes talking with a Red Cross volunteer from Jerome. Uh, she's just returned after spending a month in the area around Houston, Texas, providing disaster relief.